This is Covering the Spread, part of the FanDuel Podcast Network. The final Triple Crown race of 2023 is coming up on Saturday. It's the Belmont Stakes. We're going to break that down today with Christina Blacker getting her read on a pretty loaded field for Saturday's race. Break down her thoughts on Belmont in general and get you ready for what should be a fun Saturday of horse racing. This is covering the spread right here on the FanDuel Podcast Network and NumberFire.com. My name is Jim Sonis. I am a senior writer and analyst for NumberFire. Joined here once again by Christina Blacker. You can find her on uh, Twitter at Christina FDTV. She, of course, is a host, reporter, and analyst for FanDuel TV. We're going to preview the Belmont Stakes. And Christina, you're coming in on a high note because you called National Treasure to win the Preakness. So I feel like you're playing with house money for the, yeah, for the let's, Belmont Let's Stakes. try to keep the momentum going if we can, right? Got it right in the Preakness. I had Angel of Empire in the Derby. He was third. So we were close out there. And hopefully, fingers crossed, we can pick the right winner for the Preakness but or for the Belmont. But I'm not choosing either of them, actually. I'm going to go a okay. different direction entirely. Although both those horses are back in this field, I went a different way. It's a tough one, though. Like, you look at the names, and it's all the names we've been discussing throughout this, this Triple Crown season. It's a uh, like there are five horses who I think you could have justified betting at a certain point. So I feel like as a, as an analyst, this has to be like a delight for you to get to analyze like the true cream of the crop. It is. It's a great betting opportunity for anyone at home. And mm -hmm. I say that also because we don't have a triple crown on the line. Now for, you know, from a sportsman's perspective, of course right. you want the triple crown on the line. Right. It makes this race that much more exciting and just kind of builds up the drama. But on the years and in the additions, when we don't have a heavy favorite like that, Every horse is good value, even the favorite. I mean, Forte yeah. is the morning line favorite for the Belmont this year. He's five to two plus two fifty. So if you end up with a price like that on a favorite, you're in yeah. a pretty good position as a gambler. And we're going to talk about the favorites. We're going to talk about the post draw. We'll talk about National Treasures win and all that here in just one second. But first, a reminder to make sure you're subscribed to the Covering the Spread podcast feed wherever you get your podcast. Of course, we are also over on the FanDuel YouTube page for today. If you want some MLB money lines and strikeout props, I talked to Pitching Ninja Rob Friedman earlier on today to get his read on Friday night's very fun slate. Get that over on the FanDuel YouTube page and over on the Covering the Spread podcast feed. Now, Christina, before we talk about the Belmont, I do want to go back to the Preakness. Again, talking about National Treasure there. And they were 4-1 to one on the morning line to win that one. Obviously, they ran really well. And I want to ask you, though, because I think the Preakness is pretty unique in that it was a smaller field and stuff like that. And a lot of the horses running Saturday were not there. So did the Preakness alter the way you view National Treasure or... Was that run kind of in line with expectations and you're still kind of at the same level with National Treasure you were before? So I'll say this. I do think National Treasure has progressed. I do think he's gotten better as the year has gone on. And remember, we're talking about three-year-olds. And so we're mm -hmm. still kind of in a young stage of their career. A lot of horses start to really hit their best at about four. We call it an improving four-year-old. You'll see that improvement all the way into their five-year-old season. So I do think National Treasure is a horse that is improving right now. But I think the Preakness was unique for him in that he had the perfect setup from a race shape perspective. And I'm talking about the pace in there. When we were talking before the Preakness, I talked a lot about how I felt like he was the horse that was going to make the early lead. He was going to have the ability to go out there on the front end and try to steal it gate to wire. The day before the Preakness, we had a scratch from that field by the name of First Mission, who was really the only other horse that had any kind of early speed to contend with national treasure. So this race looked like it was served up for him on a silver platter going into the Preakness. Then you took out his main competitor from a pace perspective the day before. And it was like you handed it to him. I mean, it was a brilliant ride from Johnny Velasquez in that he used that speed. He floated horses into the first turn. He floated horses into the second turn. He really outrode the competition from a pace perspective to give National Treasure the best opportunity to win. And that's why I think it all kind of came together for him. I think he's a great horse. I think he's one of the best in this class. But I don't think he's going to end up with that setup every right. time he runs. So I don't see him as one that you're going to follow for the rest of the year. And he's just going to be winning races left and right. Right. And that's that takes nothing away from National Treasure. I think it's, it says more about this field because it is yes. very tough. And we'll talk about the field here in a second. But 
it's not just the field. It's also the track because all these tracks are super unique. They're at Belmont Park for this weekend. And what's your kind of analysis of this track? What are unique traits about Belmont and how it differs from the previous two Triple Crown races? Belmont is dramatically different from Pimlico, where we run the Preakness, and from Churchill Downs, where we run the Kentucky Derby. So Belmont is a mile and a half oval in circumference. It's a huge track. And because of that, you think not only is the stretch pretty long, but the turns are really big. So these big, wide, sweeping turns that they have at Belmont, as opposed to a tighter turn at a Pimlico, a tighter turn at a Churchill Downs, or really at a lot of other racetracks across the country. Belmont is unique in and of itself. It's also affectionately referred to as Big Sandy. It's a deeper surface. So you think about yourself if you're out running on the beach. If you're down running near the ocean, it's a little bit more firm, right? And you're going to hit your stride and you're going to feel good and you might feel like you have a little more endurance. You go up to the top of the beach where you first enter and you get into that deep sand and all of a sudden you don't feel as fit anymore. And it's a lot more work to get over a track like that. So that is what is unique about Belmont, the circumference, the actual dirt surface itself. And then the fact that we are going a mile and a half. So in horse racing, a mile and a half is basically a marathon. Once you hit 10 furlongs and beyond, you're talking marathon horses. And these are, again, three-year-olds. This is the farthest we've ever asked them to compete and over a demanding surface. That's why Belmont gets the nickname the test of a champion, because it really is a difficult set of circumstances for a young horse to go into and excel at. And part of the reason the circumstances could be more difficult this week is because of the smoke issues in New York. And that's obviously impacting Belmont Park. So their training was interrupted earlier on this week. Does that introduce more variance into your handicap, given that there are some more variables you can't really account for in that sense? Right. So it does in a way, but... I'll trust in the New York Racing Association and kind of their decisions, right, to move forward. So they did interrupt training a little bit. A lot of these horses would have just walked in the barns for the last couple of days. They are going to race on Friday. They missed the Thursday program. So Friday is a go. Saturday is a go, provided that it doesn't get any worse. But they're very confident that the air quality is going to clear up enough to be a healthy enough environment for everybody to compete, for the human athletes to compete, for the horses to compete. At this point, as far as fitness goes, though, if you aren't fit enough by Wednesday or Thursday, you're not fit enough by Saturday. I mean, it's just too late to make up that kind of fitness. This is training that has been happening for months for these horses. So I'm not as concerned about their fitness. And again, I'll just leave it to, you know, the officials there that are making those kind of decisions to decide whether or not this is a healthy enough environment. And as of right now, they're saying that it is. And it does seem like there's been an increased emphasis on on safety and health recently, which is a good thing. So I definitely think that's, you know, trusting them, people on the ground to make the right decision is probably wise as well. Now, part of the reason you were on National Treasure at the Preakness was a post draw. They got that inside post and you were talking about the blinders and how they'd be able to run their race. Now, looking at the post draw for the Belmont, anything stand out to you in terms of how it alters the way you view horses for this race? It doesn't really bother me. Post position in the Belmont is not as significant. For one thing, we have a nine horse field in here. When you're talking about the Kentucky Derby and you're talking about post position with 20 horses over a tighter track, that's when it really comes into play. We thought it came into play in the Preakness because National Treasure drew the rail and that gave him the best opportunity to be on the lead and to save ground all the way around there. Back to the kind of talk of the circumference of this track. So where they start for the Belmont, they have a good long run into that first turn. And then you have that big first sweeping turn as well. You don't really want to get hung out too wide on that first turn. That would be my only thing that I would say is something to keep in mind. Like if you had a horse that was a speed horse who was drawn on the outside, maybe that would be a concern because they're really going to have to use themselves to get to that position. But the Belmont is not generally a race that is conducive to a horse that wants to go gate to wire because of the mile and a half. It takes a lot to be a front runner out there at 10 furlongs. So I don't think the post position draw is going to affect this one much at all because of the track and because of the short field, really the nine horses that we have. And that allows you to handicap this one pretty straight up. So let's talk yep. about the field, Christina, because it is a great one. We have got Forte, Tappet Trice, Angel of Empire, National Treasure, all five to one or shorter as of right now. So who's the favorite? And is that horse a betting value in your eyes? So I think the favorite is going to be Forte. Remember, Forte was the favorite for the Kentucky Derby. He was scratched the morning of the Derby because of a foot bruise. 
something very, very minor, but just terrible timing. And it's a real gut punch for the horse's connections because Mage, who Forte beat twice in the prep season, won the Derby. And there's never another Derby. You can only run it three years old. So for Forte, this is like, this is waking up the morning of the Super Bowl and not being able to play for whatever reason. Like this is, this is as much of sort of pouring salt into the wound as it gets. I think he's coming back in a big way. But for me personally, I'm not going to bet Forte because I know he did miss a good chunk of training because of that foot bruise. When something like that happens, you really have to back off a horse and you have to give them the time just to heal and to, you know, get back to hundred percent. When you're dealing with foot issues, then when you come back, you're going to come back a little bit gingerly into that training because you don't want to re-aggravate anything. So I do think there's a bit of a fitness concern for Forte going a mile and a half off this kind of a break. Remember he hasn't actually raced since April the 1st because he was training to the Derby, then had to miss the Preakness. Now here we are, you know, three weeks later from the Preakness for the Belmont. So he's five to two, he's plus 250. He might come down a little bit in price. I do think that he is the classiest source of this group. He might just have the class and the caliber to overcome the fitness issue in here. So if you if you want to bet him, I can't say no. I, I, think, he's, I think he's the best horse. But for me, I like a horse like Tappet Rice, who's his stable mate, who hasn't missed a beat, who ran in the Kentucky Derby, although he didn't run very well in the Derby. He was seventh that day. But when I personally handicapped the Belmont, I I could have told you this was my Belmont horse back in February. (laughs) I handicap horses that I think can run a mile and a half. I handicap horses that I think have the stride for Belmont. And Tappet Trice is that horse. He's also a son of Tappet, his father. So Tappet is a stallion that gives a lot of stamina to his offspring, four of the last eight Belmont winners have been sons of Tappet. So he has this combination of pedigree of physical makeup and of fitness that I think is going to be really hard to defeat in the race this weekend. Tappet Trace for me all day. He's three to one. He's plus 300. I think he will be the second choice at the, when we get to post time, but he's, he's hands down my Belmont horse. I don't know about national treasure. I don't know if he wants a mile and a half. And again, he doesn't get the setup that he had in the Preakness. Angel of Empire is another one that could win it. He definitely, definitely could win it. But I don't know that once he hits his best stride and once Tappet Trice hits his best stride, I think if you line the two of them up, Tappet Trice gains momentum with distance. Tappet Trice almost lowers his body like a car. You think like a car like drops down and accelerates. That's what he does when he hits his best momentum. And I think once he hits his best stride, he's better than Angel of Empire. Reduced drag. Love it. Okay. Yeah, exactly. So tap it, try three, one Christina's pick here for the Belmont stakes. And you mentioned how the length here is hard to compare to. And it, does that mean that there's no real comps to look at, to judge tap it, Trice's length is, is it really the pedigree that makes you say with confidence that that background, uh, that, that lineage is what makes them built to win this kind of race. Uh, Well, so the speed figures, I think, will still help you. You know, like Mm -hmm. you can be looking at the racing form. You can be looking at Thurgraph. You can look at the patterns that we would generally use to handicap a race like this coming in. And it is going to help you. And I think on numbers, Tappa Trice is right there with the other, you know, horses of this field. Same thing with Angel of Empire. He's a horse that to me on his speed figures and numbers, he seems like he's still improving. He's still on the right trajectory for improvement. So yeah, speed figure wise, he fits right there. You can definitely use that. But I think you also have to, in your handicapping for a race like this, isolate the distance and first start with who do I think can get a mile and a half? And then of that group, who do I think is the best? Okay. And Tappa Trice via the lineage is kind of proven that would be a place where they may excel. Now, it's not just the 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 big race for the Belmont Stakes. There are other ones too. So when you look at the entire car, Christina, any other horses you're looking at? Any other bets or horses you want to mention as far as non-win bets for uh, the Belmont Stakes? What else stands out to you for this weekend? Definitely. So it's a phenomenal card top to bottom. The Belmont is race number 12 on the day. There's 13 total. And we have so many champions of the game coming back to run this weekend. This is what a card like this will attract. We have a horse like Cody's Wish, who's going to be a short price, but he's one of the stories of the year from kind of a sentimental standpoint. He was named after a little boy who has some pretty significant health challenges. And he met this boy, Cody Dormer, as a foal. 
and they had this amazing connection. And Cody's parents travel to the race every time he competes. Cody doesn't speak. He's in a wheelchair. But when he is around this horse, he has this incredible kind of way of lighting up. And he does clearly express himself in those moments. And the horse, you'll watch him. He goes down. He just drops his nose right in front of him. And he he gets it. Like there's this amazing yeah. connection between those two. So from a sentimental standpoint, and if you're someone that – you know, you just want to maybe try to get some friends to be involved in horses or, or find something to latch on to. You got to watch that race and just tell them the story of Cody's wish. From a handicapping and gambling standpoint, there's a few horses I really like. In race 12, uh, Charlie Appleby has two horses in there. Ottoman Fleet is one of them. And then his other horse, I'm going to try to figure out the name of it really quickly because I have them all here. Two of them in there for for Charlie Appleby. Those two <laughs> would be the two horses in the 11th. I'm sorry, the 11th race. I've got so many papers in front of me here. <laughs> and then in race eight, the other horse that I like, who I think you're going to get a good price, is the number 13, Drew's Gold. So James Trapman trains Drew's, Drew's Gold. He's kind of a, he's he's not a big barn, but he's a very capable trainer. He doesn't have a lot of runners, so he wouldn't be a familiar name. This horse is eight to one on the morning line. He's four for four and undefeated. He's in the deepest competition of his life on Saturday, but his speed figures and his pattern shows that he's sitting on a big race and he probably could run the best of his career. So I really like Drew's Gold, and I think he's going to be dismissed because he does run for a smaller barn. Okay, Drew's Fleet, 8 to 1. That's in race 8 on Saturday. Race 11, Ottoman Fleet, uh, yes. the horse that Christina is on for Saturday. Christina, it has been a pleasure getting to talk to you throughout this entire Triple Crown season. It's been a delight to get to learn more about this uh, this fun sport. So I appreciate it. Hopefully, uh, I think you said you're flying to London next week. So good luck with yes. that. I mean, it never Royal ends. Asket. I found the other horse, by the way, Warren oh, yeah. Point. Okay, so it's Warren, Warren Point. Point and Ottoman Fleet in race 11. Perfect. And then Drew's Warren. Gold in the 8th. Tapatrice well, in the Belmont. <laughs> three to one, Ottoman Fleet, Warren Fleet, and then Drew's Gold, eight to one. Uh, that's in race number eight. Christina, good luck. Have fun. Thank you. Um, uh, enjoy, and hopefully we'll talk to you again here on the show. Talk some more horse racing. It's been a blast so far. Anytime. It's been really fun. Please call anytime. Absolutely. Well, Christina, thank you. We'll talk to you later. That again was Christina Blacker. You can find her on Twitter at Christina FDTV. Find all of her work over at FanDuel TV. Check out all the great work they are doing over there. Uh, she is a host, analyst, and reporter for FanDuel TV doing some fantastic stuff. It is almost time to crown a new NBA champion, and FanDuel wants you to be part of the excitement because right now, new customers can get a no-sweat first bet up to $2,500. That's $2,500 back in bonus bets if your first bet doesn't win. There's no better place to bet all the finals action than America's number one sportsbook, FanDuel, official sports betting partner of the NBA. Must be 21 plus and present in select states. First online real money wager only, $10 deposit required. Refund issued is non withdrawable bonus bets that expire in 14 days. Restrictions apply. See full terms at FanDuel.com slash sportsbook. FanDuel is offering online sports wagering in Kansas under an agreement with Kansas Star Casino, LLC. Gambling problem? Call 1-800-GAMBLER or visit FanDuel.com slash RG in Arizona. 1-800-NEXT-STEP or text next step to 53342 in Connecticut. 1-888-789-7777 or visit ccpg.org slash chat. In Indiana, 1-800-9-WITH-IT. In Wyoming and Kansas, 1-800-522-4700. 4700 or in Kansas, ksgamblinghelp.com. Louisiana is 1-877-770-STOP. In Massachusetts, gamblinghelplinema.org or call 800-327-5050 for 24-7 support. In Maryland, mdgamblinghelp.org. In New York, 1-877-8-HOPE-NY or text hope Y. And in West Virginia, 1-800-GAMBLER.net. That's going to wrap things up here for today and this week here on Covering the Spread. We have got a Game 4 NBA Finals preview up on the Covering the Spread podcast feed. Talked to Tom Vecchio about that yesterday. Uh, you can find a timestamp for when that discussion begins. In the episode description, also talk some NASCAR uh, for Sonoma in there as well. And then earlier today, as mentioned, we had Rob Freeman, Pitching Ninja, on to talk some strikeout props. FanDuel has a market where you can bet the pitcher to lead the night in strikeouts. And you had a pretty fun one for that. So 
Find that in the Covering the Spread podcast feed along with a couple of money lines I like for MLB for tonight. One final thank you to Christina Blacker. Find her on Twitter at Christina FDTV and find all of her fantastic work over on FanDuel TV as well. I am on Twitter at Jim Sadas, J-I-M-S-A-N-N-E-S. You can also follow the FanDuel Podcast Network at FanDuel Podcast. Hope you all had a fantastic week. Good luck to you betting the Belmont or other stuff across this weekend. We'll talk to you once again on Monday for more. This has been Covering the Spread right here here on the FanDuel Podcast Network.